Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this, the second of AFB's webinar in our, Outlook, in our Outlook series. I trust you're all settled in now with a nice cup of tea and maybe some sugar fixes for the next hour. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we focused on future opportunities to address air quality in Northern Ireland, and that very much aligned with one of our key science themes around enhancing the natural and marine environments. I'm pleased to say that in a couple of weeks' time, on the 2nd of July, we'll have another webinar, and this time that it will align with our second key research science area, which is protecting animal, plant and human health. And the topic of that webinar will be safeguarding Northern Ireland's natural capita from invasive alien species. So these alien species can take the form of pests, pathogens or insects, our crops, grasslands and forestry. So it'll be interesting to hear what our AFI researchers are doing in that space um, and to help mitigate those risks. However, today we're here uh, to talk to discuss the future of dairy production to 2030. And indeed that aligns with our third key area of science around leading improvements in the agri food industry. Northern Ireland's climate and soil types are very much best suited to pasture-based food production. As such, the production of meat and milk from cattle and sheep are very predominant sectors within Northern Ireland's landscape. In particular, the dairy sector is a huge, huge contributor to our economy. So some data from the Dairy Council tells us that here in Northern Ireland, we have over 310 producing 2,335 million litres of milk. And this all contributes to an annual turnover of the dairy industry of about 925 million pounds per year, of which 323 million pounds per year represent export sales. However, the dairy industry isn't without its challenges. And today I'm delighted that two of our key dairy scientists, Dr. Conrad Ferris and Dr. Debbie McConnell, will share with us what they envisage as some of the big challenges for the Northern Ireland dairy industry in the next 10 years. But more importantly, what opportunities they see are available to us for addressing those challenges. So Conrad will present first, and Conrad will present for approximately 20 minutes. Conrad will focus on nutrition and silage and milk quality, antimicrobial resistance and the environment. So it's quite a wide ranging presentation, but Conrad will draw out some of the key opportunities to address these issues. We'll then take questions for Conrad after his presentation, after which we'll move on to Debbie. And Debbie will present for another 20 minutes and her, the focus of Debbie's presentation will be around grassland management, with a particular emphasis on looking to how climate change into the next 20 to 30 years could affect our ability to grow grass here in Northern Ireland. So again, Debbie, we'll ask Debbie a few questions after her presentation. Hopefully you've all now generally familiarised yourself with WebEx, um, but if you haven't, if you would like to ask a question, down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see circular icons. If you go to the circle that has three dots and click it, and whenever it opens up, you should see a Q and A icon. So if you click on that Q and A icon, over to the right hand side, you'll then see a bar where you can type in your question. And that it's really important to send that question to all panelists. That way, Debbie Conrad and I can see the questions coming through and I'll be able to ask the questions after their respective interview. So with no further ado, I'd like to hand over to Conrad to start his presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Elizabeth, for that introduction. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for taking the opportunity to listen into this presentation. As we look at the future for our dairy sector, there are certainly lots of challenges, and I'm sure we could all list those off. But as in most areas of life, challenges also bring opportunities. And this short paper will examine just a few of these. There are many that I won't deal with. In a follow-on paper this morning, then Debbie McConnell will look at some of the opportunities 
and challenges associated with grazing systems. I'm just going to begin by looking at some of the structural changes which have taken place within our dairy industry over the last 20 years and see where we look likely to go within the next 10 years. If we look at the number of dairy herds, numbers have decreased and continue to fall by about 25 herds per year. In terms of herd size, herd size continues to grow, typically increasing by an average of about two cows per, per year. Cow numbers have remained relatively steady, apart from a bit of a blip over the last few years, and I believe cow numbers will remain relatively, uh, relatively constant. However, production per litre has continued to grow, currently increasing by about 55 litres per cow per year. And I don't see any reason to believe that that's going to slow down. Certainly with genetic indexes we have at present, we can continue to increase production and improve fertility and health. However, I do believe that probably the biggest limitation to the overall structure of our industry going forward is environmental legislation. And I believe that is probably what will have the largest impact on the structure of the dairy of our local dairy sector. And legislation is already impacting herd expansion on some farms. And the environmental bit is one I'll come back to later on in this presentation. So while the trends here in terms of structure all look as if we can predict what's happening in the future, the one area where we cannot predict is milk price. And this graph here clearly shows that milk price volatility is very real. And I'd suggest it's here to stay with us, especially if we look back over the last 10 years, you can see the huge level of volatility. And in reality, we just need to look at where we are at present to understand how something that happens in a, 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 a virus that originates in a, in a part of China, in a province we probably actually haven't heard of until six months ago, can affect every area of our lives, including milk price. And we suddenly realise, yeah, volatility is a very real and present danger to our, our industry, a real challenge as we go forward. So I want to move on to look then at milk composition, and I've titled this slide a lost opportunity, which you may or may not agree with. But if we look at milk composition within Northern Ireland, and on this graph here, the blue bars represent milk fat and the red bars milk protein, you, you can see that milk composition in Northern Ireland lags behind that within the UK, the United Kingdom, uh, with the rest of the United Kingdom, and within uh, some of our European competitor countries. If we look to see why that is, unfortunately, this graph highlights very graphically that milk composition really hasn't changed in Northern Ireland over the last 25 odd years. It really has flat, flat lined. Any improvement has been extremely marginal. And for a country where a very large proportion of its milk pool is used for processing, I would suggest that poor milk composition does represent a lost opportunity for our industry. Why is milk composition not improved while well, it has in other countries? I'd suggest maybe one reason is maybe farmers are not being given a clear message that composition is really what is important. If we just look at this slide, which compares two farms, farm A and farm B. On farm A, cows are producing 8,000 litres of milk with average Northern Ireland fat and protein content. And on farm B, they're producing 7,500 litres of milk but with more of a European level uh, of fat and protein. The two farms are actually producing the same amount of milk solids, and in general, that's what our processors are interested in. However, at a milk price, and I put this in at 26 pence per litre, at a milk price of 26 pence per litre, farm B is actually 40 pounds less off, well off per cow than farm A is. If the milk price was 32 pence per litre, that's 70 pounds per cow less well off. So for a hundred cow herd, that's 7,000 pounds less going to that farmer, despite the fact that he's actually providing the exact same amount of milk solids. If we look what happened has happened in the Republic of Ireland, we can see that there has been a real improvement in milk composition over the last 25 odd years, and it is continuing. And really, admittedly, milk fat was from a much lower base than where we are. If we ask, if we look at the reasons for that, well, probably a lot of it comes down to the payment structure. Around 2000, uh, the next 10 years or so, most processors introduced a solids-based payments uh, structure. And more recently, when you can really see milk composition has taken off in the last few years, they introduced an A plus B minus C payment structure. Uh, so really, I'd suggest that the Republic of Ireland processors sent a very clear message to their dairy farmers 
that milk solids was what was required. And perhaps that's what's really needed in Northern Ireland if we are going to change the current situation. How do we do it? I'm not going to dwell on that in this presentation, uh, but certainly we know nutrition is really important for milk composition. But I suggest that certainly genetics is the one thing that can really turn our milk composition around fairly rapidly. There are sires out there that could allow farmers to greatly improve fat and protein content within a couple of generations very dramatically. So genetics probably is the key answer here. So moving on to look actually at a different aspect of milk composition, and this is more focusing on an opportunity, and that's unlocking the potential of MIR. When milk samples are analysed by dairy processors or by milk recording organisations, they use a technique called MIR, or mid-infrared uh, mid reflectance spectroscopy. And that really, in simple terms, involves shining a light on the milk sample. Some of that light is absorbed, some of it's reflected, and a spectra is produced. And there you can see a typical spectra. This is from 10 of the cows in the Hillsborough herd. And while the general pattern is much the same for all cows, you can see the different colored lines are slightly different for individual cows. And based on that spectra, that's what is used to predict the fat and the protein content of the milk. And of course, that's very useful from, a, uh, from various practical point of views for genetic selection. And of course, just in terms of management, that the protein ratio, ratio we know is linked to energy balance of individual cows. But I suggest that MIR can tell us so much more about individual cows other than just fat and protein content. And this is where I believe there is an opportunity. This is something that has been examined in a number of EU projects, one of which is G plus E. And just to highlight some of the outcomes of this, the G plus E project uh, has shown that uh, using MIR, we can identify individual cows that are metabolically at risk. Those very high yielding cows that are maybe likely to be pushed over the edge in early lactation. It can also have an environmental uh, benefit in that we can identify cows that are high methane emitters, and we can identify cows that utilize nitrogen either more efficiently or less efficiently. We can also identify cows that produce healthy milk. So really I'd say that MIR does offer a very significant opportunity to improve individual cow management. It's not yet perfect, and that's certainly a challenge for researchers, and there are quite a number of groups working on this, to try to improve it, improve the precision of it. But I think there is actually a challenge for the milk recording organizations to begin to adopt the technology and maximize the amount of information that they can provide to the farmers. It's still just one single vial of milk that goes through the same instrument, we get with spectra, but we can predict so much more. So I think there are both challenges and opportunities there moving forward. Moving on to the nutrition side now, and just a little bit on silage. And I do believe that grass silage will remain the predominant conserved forage in Northern Ireland going forward. But the, qu the quality of our silage and the improvements over the last uh, 20 odd years is something that is of concern. Oven dry matter has improved probably by about five to 6% over the last 20 years. And that's very positive because we know a drier silage is ferment better and will have higher intakes. But when we look at the trends in metabolizable energy, you can see, unfortunately, there hasn't been any real long-term improvement here. And uh, uh, metabolizable energy is one of the key drivers of intake and performance. So that's something that we really do need to address. Why is, milk com or why is silage composition not improved? Well, we looked at that in a survey of 180 uh, dairy farmers a couple of years back and probably unex uh, not unexpectedly weather was one of the key parameters that farmers said was uh, preventing improvement either too wet to cut too wet to lift too wet to wilt or too wet actually get out onto fields get machinery in there to start off with and there's not a lot can be done with the weather and of course farmers have been living with the weather for a long time but then there were a number of other much more practical uh, issues that were impacting on silage quality, such as slurry and soil residues on the silage, unavailability of the contractor, uh, winter growth, uh, getting a uh, winter growth grass getting into the pit, inadequate compaction, again, probably reflecting the use of compact uh, contractors and high residual nitrogen levels. Also, poor sport quality, especially on corn acre ground, was highlighted. And delays to harvest to reduce cost. And it's the last two points that I'm just going to say a little bit about on the next slide. Uh, so whenever we did uh, do the questionnaire, a number of farmers told us they believe silage quality had improved considerably on their farms. So we were intrigued to know what really was driving that. And the two key parameters that came up uh, from most of those farmers were harvesting better quality swords and earlier cutting of grass. 
In terms of uh, harvesting better quality swords, Debbie's going to speak a little bit about uh, reseeding sword renewal in her presentation. But really with regards uh, earlier cutting, I think just to highlight a couple of points here, about 50% of farmers said that delaying harvest to allow the crop to bulk up to reduce harvest cost was having some sort of negative impact on silage quality. So that was something farmers were saying, yeah, we, we do this, there is an issue there. And also 64% of farmers said that if, of the, these are farmers who use contractors, said that they would consider cutting earlier if a yield-based payment system was in place. So I think there is a bit of work to be done there. Certainly payment systems are all very variable, contractor payment systems, but there is still a perception, let the crop bulk up, let's reduce costs. And I think that's something that probably needs to be addressed going forward with our contractors and farmers working together, as they increasingly are. In terms of uh, earlier cutting, I think there is a challenge here in deciding when to cut. And I think this challenge particularly arises when farmers are trying to cut earlier and maybe moving towards a multi-cut system. And we know there is a real trade-off here between yield and silage quality. And I think just getting a better understanding of that is something that we really need to do as we move forward. And just really understanding just how that sward develops, how the stem uh, develops, how the seed head moves up, and how the fibre is increasing and lignification is increasing. And I think it's probably an area we haven't made a lot of progress on. Probably 30 plus years ago at university, I was told that digestibility falls by 3% uh, each week. And that's probably the same sort of, sort of figure that's still batted around at present. So I think there is real potential uh, to develop markers. And we're just talking about understanding what's happening in this ward to give farmers a real better understanding of when is optimum to cut uh, as we go forward. So a real opportunity there. In terms of concentrate usage, as the world population grows, the use of human food for ruminant livestock is increasingly being challenged. And I know that's a very general statement that I've made there, but I think there's a lot of truth behind that it is. Uh, people are increasingly uh, questioning that. Locally, concentrated feed usage has increased very dramatically over the last two decades. And of course, with that increase, there have come a lot of benefits. The performance increases that I highlighted earlier, a lot of that is due to uh, increased concentrate feeding. And of course, without concentrates, we couldn't feed the higher yielding cows that we have on our farms at present. But of course, the downsides are costs. Concentrates are more expensive and again, extremely variable in costs. Uh, about 75, 60 to 70 percent of variable costs on farms at present are from concentrates. The more concentrates we feed, of course, forage juice goes down, and that's one of our key resources. And I do suspect on many farms there are cows being fed at a level of concentrates, which really is just not efficient in terms of performance. There are also the environmental issues to do with phosphorus, which I'll highlight later. And the one maybe I'll just say a little bit about is supply chains. I'm just focusing here on soya. Approximately 170,000 tonnes of soya is fed each year to dairy cows within Great Britain. That's the data I was able to get. And most of that is imported. And I think really one thing that uh, our current uh, pandemic has highlighted to us is the danger of long supply chains, be that supply chains for uh, personal protective equipment, antibiotics, or for animal feeds. Certainly, long supply chains have risks associated with them. And that does lead to the question, can we grow more locally produced protein crops here in Northern Ireland or within the UK in general? And one area that we have particularly looked at here is the use of field beans. So field beans, it is a crop that can be grown within Ireland, quite widely grown in the cereal areas in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, it's a lower protein content than soy and rape, but it does have a high starch content. So it's an interesting uh, feed for animals from that point of view. We've carried out a number of studies here looking at field beans in this one, which was a study that David Johnson did as part of his PhD a couple of years ago. Uh, we, we looked at field bean inclusion levels from zero right up to 8.4 kilograms uh, per cow per day. Not a level we're recommending, but we did push it out because we were involved in research. And you can see here, total dry matter intake was on, unaffected, milk yield was unaffected, but we did find a bit of a reduction in uh, milk fat plus uh, protein yield. And as you can see there, something that possibly we could have avoided if we had put in some protected amino acids. But I think the main point from this slide is that we were able to totally replace all soya, all imported soya and rapeseed meal using a locally grown protein crop in the diet of our cows.
So there is something going forward just in terms of shorter supply chains that I think will be looked at increasingly. Moving on really to environmental challenges. And over the last two decades, we've seen a real escalation of environmental challenges for dairy farmers. I suppose if I put some sort of timeline on it, and this really reflects maybe more the research timeline, uh, back around 2000, water quality issues uh, became a real big issue in Northern Ireland, uh, driven really by trying to implement the nitrates directive and water quality, especially in regards to phosphorus. Probably about 10 years later, the whole climate change and greenhouse gas uh, issue came on the scene in terms of research and then more recently ammonia emissions and the potential of ammonia to impact environmentally sensitive areas has become a real, a, a real challenge. I think the key thing here is that it is cumulative. Just because we're now focused on ammonia doesn't mean that water quality and climate change has gone away. In reality, we're now trying to deal with all three of these. By 20 years ago, we were only focused probably on water quality, and that's certainly a real challenge. Just really in terms of water quality, certainly there was good news for quite a number of years with soluble reactive phosphorus levels in our rivers uh, in Northern Ireland declining. However, for the last few years, we have lost some of the gains that had been made earlier. And there are all sorts of reasons for that. But for this audience today, I do believe that uh, reducing phosphorus levels in our concentrates, which is something our feed industry has already adopted, is something that going forward, we will have to even push further and lower. We will probably even have to move lower in terms of P levels. With regards to climate change, there are many approaches being examined. And of course, genetics, nutrition are all part of that. But I think there is a real good news story here, a, a real win-win situation in that we know that anything we do to improve the overall efficiency of the whole milk production system, right from calf rearing, heifer rearing, getting a heifer's calving down to 24 months, increased longevity, the whole picture, anything we do to improve longevity reduces greenhouse gases and ultimately, ultimately improves profitability for farmers. So I think there is a real opportunity to do that within a win-win scenario. With regards to ammonia, I'm not going to dwell on it because there was a webinar two weeks ago on it. Just to highlight, it is a very significant challenge. There are several major research programs underway to look at ammonia. And one that I just want to highlight, a piece of research we're hoping is going to get up and going within the next few weeks, is looking at lower protein diets for dairy cows. And I think that's really important because if we want to tackle ammonia, the first place probably to start is to make sure that less nitrogen goes into the dairy system through lower protein diets. So we're putting less nitrogen in to start off with. Ultimately, there's going to be less nitrogen, nitrogen escaping to produce ammonia. So really just in terms of the environmental challenge, maybe looking at the big picture uh, just on this slide. And it is that there are very diverse challenges here. And I think the diversity of the challenges does have some impact on how much progress we can make. And we have all sorts of tools with greenhouse gas calculators, with a phosphorus balance calculator, lots of tools around to help farmers to, to make progress. Uh, but I think just going forward, probably we need to focus more on holistic type tools that will encompass not just one nutrient, but nitrogen, phosphorus, greenhouse gases, and ammonia in a much more holistic way. As we do that, as we move to those systems, and I think that's probably where we will eventually go, we need to have systems that have more automation of data inputs. So it'll be pulling data from different sources. And of course, there are all sorts of challenges with that. And I do believe whatever system we develop does need to have real quality assurance built into it, it needs to have inbuilt validation. So we're really uh, absolutely 100% uh, sure that the data is, is completely valid. The reason I say that is I believe that increasingly farmers need to be rewarded for meeting societal needs. And as we leave the EU, uh, we have an opportunity to decide what sort of form payments to farmers are going to be made. And I do believe that going forward, those are going to be very much based on meeting societal needs. And as such, there needs to be an assurance in the type of uh, the, the information that is provided by farms. Just really finishing up on the environmental side, Environmental constraints are going to become more stringent in the future. They're only going one direction, and that's certainly a challenge. But I think there's an opportunity there because as environmental constraints become uh, more tight, it does force efficiency on farmers, and that efficiency is going to have long-term benefits. So there are both challenges and opportunities with regards to the environment. Really, just the last area that I'm going to touch on is that's the whole issue of my antimicrobial use. 
And I think it's really pertinent at, uh, at present uh, because I think our current pandemic has certainly highlighted the risks of human-animal interactions with regards to diseases. It's really brought that to the fore. Uh, before our current uh, pandemic, global concerns about antimicrobial resistance were, were increasing. There was real concern about that. And, and I do believe that the current pandemic will bring it even more to the fore. In reality, I think the predictions of the number of lives will be lost due to antimicrobial resistance potentially are way out number the lives likely to be lost due to coronavirus. So it's a huge issue. So how do we deal with it? Well, really moving forward, it's about improving the health status of our herds. And we can do that lots of ways through genetics. Uh, already we can select cows that are more resistant to mastitis. Uh, by better management, by having better environments, even things like fetal programming, which is an area that we're trying to uh, bid for funding for at present. And also, also just on a very practical point of view, just changing farmers' mindsets in terms of the use of antibiotics in the same way that the human population, uh, when they see the GP, has had that same mindset changed. But we have a major project here, uh, it's called STAMP, Strategic Antimicrobial Use in Dairy Beef and Lamb Production. Uh, I'll not get into the details because of time, but really selective dry cow therapy and calf management are two of the key focuses of that research programme. And really just to finish up uh, the whole area of antimicrobials, I do believe that 2030 will be a very different environment with regards antimicrobial usage in agriculture compared to where we are today. So I think going forward, that is a challenge. But of course, with that, there are opportunities. Just to really finish off, a number of very quick conclusions. Uh, the dairy uh, sector in Northern Ireland will continue to face a wide variety of challenges. And I've hi highlighted a few of those, and there are many more which I haven't mentioned. But of course, as I said, right at the outset, with challenges come opportunities and certainly technology, genetics, uh, et cetera, bring a whole range of opportunities. So I think for our ind industry going forward, uh, the, the dairy sector, as it's done in the past, will need to continue to tackle the challenges and embrace the opportunities that arise to ensure the long term sustainability of our dairy sector. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Conrad. Um, we have maybe just a couple of minutes and a couple of questions come in. I um, encourage you to, to and more, but as I said, we maybe are a little bit tight. This was one question, Conrad, and um, we've got a couple on the milk composition piece. What, um, you know, the site has, the whole industry has a different profile of milk production, if you like, and, you know, what, what is the is there there's concern in the north here maybe with a uh, the whole industry moving to uh, the spring calving industry as opposed to nearly all year round at this moment in time can you comment maybe just on how we could maintain our current flow of milk within northern ireland but yet still achieve higher milk protein and fat content yeah Alice, there's a question that sort of is whenever we improve in composition and I think there is a perception that uh, I, I think for our people the industry looks to maybe New Zealand and Ireland which is very much a, a spring calving system and there is the belief well if you want to really get good composition you have to move to that system but I, I would absolutely argue that's not the case you just have to look at countries like the Netherlands which are not spring calving systems they're intensive systems higher yields than ourselves and they, they absolutely are not uh, moving to those sort of systems. Mo improving milk composition is really through genetics, and it's taking the Holstein cows that we have at present and using Holstein sires with very high, that can transmit very high levels of fat and protein on those sires. And the other thing I would also say, it's, it's not necessarily about moving to crossbreeding, and of course, that's the, the Republic, there is a, a, a fair proportion of crossbreeding within the Republic of Ireland. Crossbreeding, especially the Jersey breed research we have shown, does offer a very rapid opportunity to increase milk fat and milk protein content. But that's that's not necessarily the approach that has to be taken. There are enough Holstein sires out there with the ability to transmit uh, good fat and protein to our herds, to our lawyer to allow our industry to make real progress and, and maintain the current uh, milk production profile which our our processors are really interested in thank you conrad there's maybe just a couple of questions if i'm reading quickly uh, around brexit and 
would you be brave enough to extrapolate on perhaps any effects that Brexit could have on our milk production in Northern Ireland? And maybe, you know, especially focusing on that supply chain piece around feed imports and, and trade and free trade. Yeah, Elizabeth, it's I guess it's one that I'm I, I'm not going to speculate on. It's I, I'm not the economist, and when I know we have economists. I think there is going to be maybe a presentation. There, there are still so many known unknowns. There are real risks. We we recognise those, and probably not really sure how those are going to uh, flesh out. But of course, there are challenges with Brexit, no matter what. Uh, I, I think maybe the one thing I would say in terms of Brexit, and and I. I did actually present uh, at the webinar a couple of years ago on the impact of Brexit and just uh, and the environmental side. And I, th I think there was the, the perception beforehand, and I know this isn't the question you've asked me, but, but the perception beforehand that Brexit was going to mean we, we do away with all these environmental legislation that comes from Europe and we're going to just do our own thing. It's not going to happen. And environmental legislation is with us. If we want to trade with Europe, we're, we're going to have to maintain that. And of course, Rightly so. We want to maintain our own environment here. We want to meet our societal needs. And that, that environmental legislation is not going to disappear just because of Brexit, which I think some people did think uh, was going to be an issue. OK, one last question, um, Conrad. There's just a couple of people are asking about the fetal programming studies that we're planning. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on that for literally 30 seconds? <laughs> Yeah, Elizabeth, I'll not say too much on it because it is uh, it's an area we've applied for funding for and we're not yet aware we're going to get that. But the whole issue of fetal programming is one of huge interest. The, the area we're actually looking about is actually uh, in terms of a vitamin supplement uh, that has been shown to have impact on fetal performance uh, the calf once it's born and immunity and that's hopefully we will get funding for that uh, but if we don't get this one it, it's a big area and a lot of interest and in it. it's hope, hopefully it's an area that we will move into even if we're not successful in, in the current bid that we have in so it's really pre-programming the calf for future life it, it's benefits. actually yeah the, this research would be about how we treat the pregnant cow right con for conception and the impact of that and a lot of this ha happens at a molecular level at a gene level so it's 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 sort of way beyond me in terms of the science uh, but th that that's the level it's operating at that's really a calf is born that already has been pre-programmed to react differently to to various things and uh, it certainly is a huge up and coming field yeah thank you very much conrad and um, so we'll we'll move over to debbie now and uh, I don't know if any of you noticed there, Conrad has given away his age in the middle of all that. He was at university 30 years ago. Maybe um, there's a couple of participants on the line, I think, might have caught Conrad, but we're delighted to have you all. So we've got about 150 participants on the line, and thank you very much for your questions so far. Anything we haven't managed to answer, we will attempt to follow up and answer separately after the webinar, because we are capturing all the questions that you're sharing with us. But um, Debbie, not, I don't mean to be squeezing your time. I think we've still got time for your 20 minutes and a few questions afterwards. Um, so over to you now. Thank you, Debbie. OK, thank you very much, Elizabeth. And uh, hopefully everybody can hear me OK. Um, so uh, I just want to follow on to the second half of this webinar and take a little bit more of a focus look at one area of dairy management in particular, and that's grassland and really explore what the role of grassland has to play in our dairy production systems, looking forward to 2030 and beyond. And Conrad's already alluded to the number of key challenges that we'll face, but for me, I think grassland is going to be one of the key advantages that Northern Ireland and we really need to exploit uh, going forward um, as, we, as we look to the future to meet some of those challenges. So what I wanted to do Today was just take a little bit of a look at, um, you know, where can grassland play a role in meeting the challenges that are facing the industry. Have a look at some survey data and the state of play with the industry at the minute in terms of our, our use of grassland and our attitudes towards it. And then look at how um, I suppose we can adjust either both our management or look at um, how we adapt to future challenges such as climate change um, with grass and what that could potentially mean for us. So really just, uh, I suppose, by, by way of a bit of background, I think often uh, we forget how crucially important grassland is to our ruminant production systems here in Northern Ireland and across the UK. 
it occupies 66% of UK uh, agricultural land. Over 80% of agricultural land in Northern Ireland is improved grassland, and it accounts for over 60% of our dairy cow diets. So it's our principal feedstock we have here in Northern Ireland. Um, and so that is crucial to us. How we manage that and how we use that going forward um, will have a big input on our dairy production systems. And as we look forward, certainly we've always had a competitive advantage to grow high volumes of high quality grass. The graph that you see on the bottom right hand side of your slide um, just shows actually where we have uh, high levels of grass productivity across Europe. In the darker blue areas, highlighting those areas with the greatest grass production potential. So we're sitting right bang in the middle of that, and that's certainly something that we want to continue to exploit uh, going forward. Because doing that will help us uh, meet a lot of the challenges that Conrad has already highlighted. Um, a lot of the discussion over the past few years have been very much about improving our three pillars of sustainability within dairy systems and, and creating businesses that um, not only are resilient to the, the fluctuations in input price and milk price volatility that Conrad highlighted, but also that have uh, benefits in terms of providing a more environmentally friendly uh, uh, product um, and one that's more health conscious as well. So as we talk about green growth and about, as we think about um, uh, looking to the future, we do need more sustainable businesses. And for me, grass is absolutely essential to that. It's one of the cornerstones that we have and one of the key um, uh, uh, cases of kit in our toolbox effectively. Because if we think of even simply economic sustainability, um, you know, feed and forage costs account for over 40% of our variable costs um, on farms for us here uh, in Northern Ireland. And if we look at what it costs us to produce a ton of dry matter of raised grass, it's 52 pounds. Compare that to concentrate at 227 pounds. So there's opportunities there to make more of our homegrown forages and minimize uh, our, our exposure to volatility and input prices. Connor has already highlighted uh, the challenges from an environmental perspective, so I'm not gonna dwell on those, but we've talked a lot in recent years about again reducing concentrate price, using our, reducing concentrate usage, sorry, and improving our use of forage, and that helps reduce our phosphorus footprint. But also from an ammonia perspective, particularly when we think about grazed grass, one of the key um, uh, ammonia mitigation strategies that has been looked at is actually extending the grazing season. Because we know in grazing systems, we have the opportunity to lower our ammonia emissions per litre of milk um, in comparison to high systems. And from a social sustainability perspective, we are seeing demands for more health conscious products and uh, food products. And we know that the more we can use fresh grass and then particularly grazed grass, the opportunity that we have to improve the polyunsaturated fatty acid content of the milk and effectively create a healthier product. So grass is going to be crucial to us going forward in term, terms of building sustainability and, uh, and creating products um, that our consumers are going to want to buy. So really, where do we go from here or where, are, uh, how can we uh, really make the most of that? Well, I think firstly, we need to look and say, why are we doing it at the minute? And I think it's fair enough to say that we have got room to improve in terms of our grassland productivity and how we actually view grass as well on our, on our dairy farms here in Northern Ireland. Last year, average grassland productivity in a good, in a good uh, growing year equated to 7.9 tonnes of dry matter per hectare uh, as an average across our dairy farms. Now, we know that we can produce considerably more than that. Our grass check farms uh, produced in excess of 13 tonnes of dry matter per hectare um, in the same year. So there's huge scope there to really drive productivity um, on commercial farms. But also, I think at the minute, um, we've been doing some survey work uh, back in 2018 to understand some of the barriers towards using grassland productivity, or to using grass and, and towards grassland on dairy farms. And we find that actually grassland is viewed with relatively low importance compared to other areas of management. So the graph that you can see in your screen here shows that actually breeding, business, animal health, nutrition, and young stock are all, uh, all deemed to be much more important than grassland management. Now, some of us are obviously very keen on grass uh, uh, and, and can't imagine uh, why it's not top of the list. Um, but it is something that we do need to look at and consider actually, given that it is 60% of our dairy cow diets, are we placing enough importance on that? Are we giving it the attention that it deserves? And 
one of the things that we have noticed as well is that actually there are questions really over how we're using grazed grass in Northern Ireland. Does it still have a role in our production systems? Ron, I've already highlighted over the last couple of decades that we have seen herdside in increase and we have seen muckies increase. And the graphs here just show actually the number of the farms that we've, that we've surveyed and the different grazing strategies that they've employed. Now, if we look at the graph on the left hand side, the darker the colour of the bars, the larger the herd size. And you can see that when we look at the grazing strategy of all cows full time grazing, there's significantly less farms with lar larger farms uh, full time grazing. And those are more likely to be in housed situations. And in a similar scenario, when we look at higher milk yields, so again on the right hand side, the darker uh, yellow bars, we can see that again at higher milk yields, there's less cows full time grazing, and it's more likely that they'll be either a part of the herd grazing or cows will be grazing, won't be grazing at all. So we can see that there is, um, uh, as, as milk yields grow and as herd sizes grow, there's less emphasis placed there on grazed grass. But actually, I don't think that it can be forgotten about. We are putting more emphasis on silage. And when we look at the total figures, we estimate roughly about 53% of, of the Northern Ireland herd are, are grazing full time, 19% grazing part time, and 28% and are housed full time. So there are a number of animals, um, or we are missing out some opportunities for really grazing there during the summer months. But there are opportunities in all production systems to really make the most of grazed grass. If we simply look at an eight and a half thousand uh, litre system um, uh, and an autumn calving system, so calving from uh, September through uh, into December actually, in that scenario, you can see from the graph on the right hand side, the red bars, the grazing period, we're still in that sort of profile, we're still producing 44% of our milk during the grazing season. So almost half of our milk is still has the capacity to be produced from grazed grass. So certainly important there that we don't forget about grazed grass as the key element. And actually, given that it's our cheapest feed stuff, actually how can we make the most of that? So looking forward, you know, how do we go about doing that? I think there's three key things that we have um, uh, opportunities sitting in front of us. Firstly, we need to better understand our grass production ability in Northern Ireland. Um, we need to do that through better measurement and, and, and future modelling, and I'll come on to that in a minute. We also need to improve grass production through on-farm management and see what areas can we focus on to really drive productivity there. And then explore new ways and new techniques to boost, uh, boost grass, grass utilisation and the amount of milk that we're receiving from grazed grass. So just taking the first of those, Certainly looking to the future, or well, I suppose looking back for the last 20 years, actually, we've seen that um, grass it has provided us with a fairly sustainable forage base. Our grass check long-term monitoring has shown us that we can produce on, on average about 11 and a half tonne of dry matter per hectare fairly consistently um, throughout the seasons. But what we have noticed in the last couple of years, um, if, if 2018 isn't too far away in the memory, and we're in the middle of it now in 2020, is we have no increased variability in uh, weather um, that we are being exposed to during our grazing season. So this graph on the left hand side here is from our grass check uh, weather monitoring network uh, across the farms in Northern Ireland. And this is the average data for Northern Ireland. And you can see the blue bars are rainfall from the 1st of January to the end of May. And the green line is soil moisture or uh, let's say soil dryness. Um, and what we can typically see, we had a very heavy, uh, heavy period of rainfall in February. So actually total average rainfall for the year isn't too far behind where we would expect it to be. But since we entered into March and April, um, we've had, or sorry, April and May, we've had about 40% of the average total rainfall that we would expect to get. And the last time that happened uh, was 1980. Um, so it has been, we are in quite significantly different scenario, but the volatile, the future climate projections suggest that this type of event is likely to increase. That had a, a knock on effect on soil moisture contents over the last um, number of weeks. And we can see right away from sort of mid to end of April onwards, we are, we are in a scenario where soil moisture levels are, are so low in effect that growth is, our growth is being restricted by drought conditions. But that said, and that's having a, a significant impact on our grass growth. 
Um, so uh, this graph here shows um, our long term, the blue dotted line show our 10 year average growth curve, the green dotted line show 2018, and we can all remember um, the significant forage challenges that we faced back then, and the red line shows this year's growth. So, um, so far we're about um, almost two tonne of dry matter per hectare down on our production of where we'd expect to see. But that said, we do have significant variability across the province in Northern Ireland in terms of growth rates and growth production. We can already see a difference between uh, two tonne of dry matter between the east and west of the province in certain places. So what we, when we look forward to the future, we do need to get much better in terms of our grass growth forecasts, in terms of getting localised forecasts for individual places. But having this ability to measure uh, grass as we start to deal with these more extreme conditions will be absolutely vital, vital for us going forward and helping us deal with that. So that's what we've, what we've produced to date. This is the variability that we're more likely to see going forward. But what are our long term outlooks for grass uh, productivity? And with our grass check uh, model, um, we've been doing um, some initial look um, at what climate change could mean for us here in Northern Ireland. So last September, um, the Met Office produced uh, climate change uh, projection, uh, projections for um, the future right through to 2080. And actually, we've got some very detailed data for Northern Ireland where we can start to look at individual locations. Um, and we could start to look at separate counties. And we can get forecasts of, of what temperatures and rainfall um, and sunshine is likely to be from now uh, for every day, actually, until 2080. So there's a lot of modelling uh, work that has gone there in terms of producing those climate predictions. But in a nutshell, long term, if we look way in the future until 2080, we are expected to see somewhere between a three and six degrees increase in temperature and anywhere between a 16 and a 46 uh, percent uh, reduction in rainfall but it will become more volatile and that's the thing that we need to bear in mind. But overall, what we've done here is take a look at actually just for the next um, uh, 20 years, actually where grass productivity um, is likely to go given those climate change uh, projections, given that data. And what we've done is we've taken the climate data and put that through our grass check model for the Hillsborough site. And so what we see is actually not that much change in spring growth um, through February, March and April. Although it will be warmer, it's expected to be warmer at this time, light levels are still restricting actually the amount of uh, growth that we're expecting to see in the spring. But what we have noticed quite considerably, um, and actually 19 out of 20 of the years that we, that we modelled this for, um, we see very high uh, grass growth rates. Um, in, in particularly in May and again in June. And, and, and the data would suggest roughly we're seeing an extra potential for an extra 20% growth in May and June, June time compared to our long term or our 2010 to 2019 average. The other area where we are expected to see more growth is September, October, November, and roughly in there, particularly in the month of October, September, October, on average, we see a 61% increase in the growth that's there at that time. So there will be opportunities for extra growth to come in September, uh, September, October, and possibly for us to extend uh, the grazing season to make the most of that. Now, the question is, again, how, vol how reliable is our grass production and actually how volatile um, is, our, is that? And so when we looked at sort of the variability within that 20 years worth of data, what I've done here in this graph is just show the yellow bars are the long-term average growth for what we'd expect to see at the minute. The gray bars are what, was, what has been predicted from 2021 to 2039, but the red lines indicate the minimum and maximum uh, predicted growth rates for that particular month um, across all of those scenarios. So this is uh, growth rates in terms of kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day. So you can see there typically even in the month of June, we can see growth rate variability from uh, I think it's 53 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day at, at a low level um, compared to 139 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day. So we're going to see a lot more variability coming um, and that's something that we have to get better at managing. Um, so how are we going about doing that? Well, measurement will be absolutely crucial, particularly in that May, June time. So we have opportunities for more grass, but we need to be able to, to stay on top of it. And farmers already say that that is the most challenging time of the year for them in terms of managing grass. 
we will need forecasts with more localized projections. This is the projections for Hillsborough, but as we've already seen, there's a big east-west divide that can happen at various times of the year. So we will need to become more localized there. And with our grass check model, we've got the opportunity to do that. Um, but then we need to say, actually, what can we do on farm to really adapt to that volatility as well? So some of the things that we could potentially look at are, for example, new cultivars or new grassland species that have improved drought tolerance. Thinking of grasses, we've got our festulolums there with improved rooting, rooting capability that are being shown now that are to be more drought tolerant. But actually, we should also consider other species as well. And some data coming from New Zealand um, suggests, so for example, plantain could be uh, an act, a, a very good species to start including if we are going to be in more drought scenarios because we are more likely to, it is more drought tolerant and we are going to see extra variability uh, there in our, in our weather patterns. And we need to open, open the door to potentially look and, and research some of these new species because they can bring added benefits. The graph on the right hand side here shows um, uh, milk solids production. Uh, on uh, cows grazing towards a perennial ryegrass, a 50-50 perennial ryegrass mix, um, uh, or perennial ryegrass plantain mix, and then 100% plantain. And we can see uh, a 0.1 to 0.17 increase in kilograms of milk solids per cow per day through feeding plantain. Um, but what we also notice as well, when we think back to those challenges in terms of environmental management, we've got over a 50% reduction there in urine nitrogen concentration. So when we thinking about greenhouse gas emissions, when we're thinking about um, dealing with um, environmental concerns, certainly some of these other species might have added benefits. But we do need a lot more information in terms of grazing season length, how we manage these on farm, what impacts they have, for example, on soil structure and health and on biodiversity as well, because our grasslands are also servicing uh, those components and not just providing a forage base for us here in Northern Ireland, and that'll be incredibly important going forward. What else we can do to try and make the most of grass uh, growing forward? Well, certainly there's opportunities to look at how we can improve uh, grass production through on-farm management. Uh, we constantly talk about the value of grass measurement, but hopefully showing you that variability in the last couple of slides has really uh, hit home actually, um, you know, how much we do need to be on top of grass growth rates throughout the season. Unfortunately, at the minute, um, roughly about, well, just short of 30% of farmers in uh, dairy farmers that we interviewed um, were um, sort of undertaking some form of grass measurement, but only about 13% of farms are actually holding any form of record of how, of either grass growth rates um, or total grass production across the season. Now, why that's important is actually when we look at the farms in that survey that did have grass records, their average production was 12.5 tonne of dry matter per hectare. Compare that to our average production across the industry of 7.9 tonne, and you can see very quickly that actually those people that are engaging with measurement and recording of grass growth really does help us with productivity. We asked farmers as well what the other big challenges are in terms of uh, uh, making more from grazed grass. And whilst weather was obviously a big factor and will continue to be a big factor, and we do need solutions to deal with that, the other area, the second most common area, was grass productivity and unproductive sports. Um, and certainly um, there was scope there to really look at actually, are we receding enough and actually what value could this bring? On average in the survey, uh, grazing areas were receded nine, on average every 9.9 .9 years, silage areas 9.3 and rented land, uh, I think it was 10.2, on average every 10.2 years. And we know our economic optimum for doing a full pie is after about eight years of age, um, of a sward age. Um, and actually, if we're using minimum till methods, it actually um, our economic optimum drops to somewhere between five and six years of age, depending on the techniques that are used. So certainly there's more opportunity there to boost how we use um, uh, are how, how often that we're renewing our pastures. Interesting, one of the big areas that we need to um, improve on uh, is actually our understanding of grass varieties and grass species. Um, uh, a lot of farmers felt that that was the area where more information about how we select swards, uh, what are the particular attributes and varieties 
um, that are there, what they can bring, um, and actually how we tailor it um, to uh, individual farms in Northern Ireland. So that area of reseeding and renewing sward is very key for us going forward to boost productivity. And just thinking back to grass measurement, um, yes, at the minute, our grass measurement methods uh, through the rising plate meter can be a bit laborious, can be a little bit time consuming. Um, I would say just looking to the future, um, there are opportunities coming down the line. Some early work that we've been doing at AFI has been looking at different technologies and how effective they are at measuring grass covers on farms. So we've been trialing uh, a trailed uh, pasture meter, which um, effectively uses lasers to determine grass height. And we've been also looking at drone images, and you can see the image on the right hand side here um, from uh, drone using different types of sensors to measure grass cover, the red area being the areas of low cover in the field, the green areas being the areas of high cover. And you can see instantly we can start to view, um, there's a lot more, uh, we can see individual uh, paddock or within paddock variation, sorry, in grass covers. But so far to date, these, these technologies are there, they are producing mixed results. Um, so, but there will be, as technology improves and as um, uh, as our sensors become uh, more accurate and more robust, certainly this will be a growing area, I think, um, to really uh, focus on in the future in terms of getting uh, good grass measurements in a rapid way and in an easy uh, way as well. Just to finish, the other area that we need to be looking at and considering on farm, we're actually, if we are going to have uh, more grass available, um, but it is going to be a little bit more volatile. We need to consider actually how our management strategies are going to handle that volatility, but also then how we can work with animals to try and explore how we can encourage them to improve um, uh, grass intakes and in turn milk productivity from grass. And one, just one quick example of actually how we've done this um, at Appy Hillsborough. We were looking uh, through some work of a PhD student, Jessica Pollock, last year at 12, 24 and 36 hour grazing regimes. And something as simple as, as allocating grass every 36 hours instead of every 12 hours gave us a 15% increase in the performance of uh, first lactation animals. Um, and, what we, and the reason behind that was because we were able to manipulate animals' grazing behaviour by offering them grass every 36 hours compared to every 12 hours. And overall, our herd performance from that treatment was uh, better. Um, what, what in effect happened there is those animals that were under a 12-hour uh, grazing regime um, were in a more competitive environment, had to increase their rate of intake when they were grazing, so they didn't masticate as much when, when they were eating that sward, so they weren't chewing it as they were swallowing the grass, and then and they expended a significant amount more energy in rumination later on during the nighttime um, and even during the daytime uh, in some treatments. Um, so those animals effectively, by changing their grazing behaviour in a 36-hour um, grass allocation then had more energy available for milk production um, and uh, resulted in overall farm performance. So there are simple things that we can do on farm that again um, can help us boost productivity and how we utilize grass um, in terms of turning it into milk. So I think that's that's pretty much where I wanted to finish today but just sort of uh, to wrap up certainly Northern Ireland looking forward will retain its ability to produce high volumes of grass um, our long-term forecast would suggest that. That will give us still a key forage base, but it will be more variable and we will need new management strategies to try and deal with that variability. Certainly from industry trends, I think there are opportunities to focus on grazed grass in our production systems, given, given the advantages that it can bring to us in terms of improved sustainability, lower feed costs, lower environmental um, uh, impacts, um, et cetera. And finally, we really need to be looking at sort of opening our eyes to new techniques of grass measurement, new grassland species, and new ways of grazing, which will help us achieve increased output from grazed swords. So thank you very much for listening, and I'll pass back to Elizabeth if there are any questions. Thank you, Debbie. Um, I'm just very conscious of time, but one quick question, and it probably relates back to you know, our future grass swords and what's in them. So, you know, you demonstrated very nicely that with climate change, we're going to have more grass, but it's going to be that the variance in your grass is huge. So it really emphasizes the need for 
good prediction tools, the likes of the grass check tool, not only to predict you know, the, the impact of the climate on grass growth, but also um, to then predict the environmental impacts of that. But what then is the role of the actual species mix in the grass sward? You know, what, what can you postulate from that perspective? And I hope I haven't lost you, Debbie. I'm not quite sure if you guys can see me, but I think we've lost Debbie due to bandwidth. So I think with the interest of time, we'll maybe get Debbie to follow up on that question separately. But in the meantime, I'd like to just wrap up this dairy webinar and apologize for this final glitch, just as Debbie was um, going to answer. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, I hope you have had lots of very useful information and a view and a vision for what we see as the future of the dairy industry here to 2030. So just to remind you that in two weeks time on the 2nd of July, we will have another webinar entitled Safeguarding Northern Ireland's Natural Capital from Invasive Alien Species. And the registration for that will be open very soon. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to join us for that. It will look specifically at pests, pathogens and insects that really could have a significant impact on our plants, grass, crops, forestry. And Colin Fleming and Arch Murchie from our team in, in the plant health team in um, AFBI will give us two presentations on that topic, as I say, on the 2nd of July. So, Debbie, you're back. Um, I'll maybe, I don't know if you caught my last question. I know people are, are dropping off and I appreciate mm -hmm. that, but it's really just around the grass species that could be in our mixes going forward to improve resilience. Have you any just final comments you want to elaborate on that and then we'll close it off? Yeah. I think it's a it's a really interesting area that we definitely need to be looking at. I, I mean, I highlighted plantain there as one potential option, um, but in terms of uh, looking across our other the board, there are other species, chicory, for example, that is quite drought tolerant that could potentially serve as a role for us. Or we need to be uh, we also need to be looking at for the, for example multi species swords where we're bringing you may, bringing in attributes of clover, chicory, plantain, or even just perennial ryegrass. I think across the board, when we're looking at grass species, it is resilience to climate change, but also we need to reflect that our, our grasslands going forward do need to deliver a number of other ecosystem services. So by bringing in extra species, we do have the capacity to improve soil structure and improve health. Soil health, we do have the capacity to potentially um, reduce the amount of nitrogen that we need to grow, and we do have the capacity um, to um, provide extra habitats um, uh, through um, sort of improved microfauna and microflora life um, uh, in in those wards as well. So there is plenty that these wards can offer, but I think for us, from a research perspective going forward, we really need to know how we're going to manage them on farm what the potential is in terms of the quality of the forage that they will supply to dairy cows, how do we manage seasonal variation in them, um, and then what that can mean for us in terms of providing a more forage, uh, sustainable forage base. And even just looking in within perennial ryegrass itself, there are varieties that have different rooting structures, and that's something that we need to explore in more detail as well. They actually are these more drought tolerant. So lots of opportunity here, um, lots of uh, potential uh, suppose, combinations that you could put in this board. And we really need to look at that in a lot more detail going forward to see actually how, how they would uh, withstand our delightful climate here in Northern Ireland. So we do see a big evolution of our grass ward mix going forward likely um, to deal with that climate change in the next 20, 30 years. Thank you very much, Debbie, and thank you very much, Conrad. Thank you to our comms and IT teams again um, for helping to facilitate this. There's been a lot of work in the background to try and iron out those glitches, um, but we're at the, the mercies of broadband. Um, thank you to our participants and for participating in the questions. Um, I hope you enjoyed it, as I said, and perhaps we'll hopefully see you on the 2nd of July. So for now, thank you very much, everybody, and have a good day. Bye-bye. <laughs>